one and a half thousand years ago, the Mediterranean was the most fiercely contested battleground the world had ever known. The legend grew of a warship that prowled the seas, incinerating everything in its path. The true forerunner to today's destroyers, the fire ship. 100 foot long and powered by up to 100 oarsmen, the myths hint at military hardware way ahead of its time. Power strapped to the gunnels were giant incendiary firing catapults. And how from the prow of the ship it belched flaming oil. The fire ships were long and sleek. They looked like hungry wolves, if you like. Uh, all banks moving up and down in unison. Very scary vessels to see coming towards you. And particularly, of course, when you didn't expect this great spout of fire to come off the front. What ancient technology spewed this deadly incendiary mixture is not known. Only that it was called Greek fire. Nothing less than an ancient precursor to napalm. It was the super weapon of the Byzantines for over 500 years. The Byzantines were ancient Romans who, as Rome declined and fell, had established a new empire in the east based around the great fortress city of Constantinople. In 674 AD, their emperor, Constantine IV, took on a terrifying new power, the Muslims of the Middle East. The Arabs had called the first jihad, or holy war, against his empire. The fire ship was his response. This is a revolutionary new weapon. Not only does it burn up enemy ships, it's frightening, it's terrifying. The world wouldn't have been the same if the Byzantines had lost Constantinople. The Eastern Roman Empire would have died then. Um, Eastern Europe would have become Muslim quite quickly. It changed history. But the emperors buried the technology behind the ship's awesome firepower. Now, after a thousand years, we are set to crack a Byzantine state secret. A fire ship is set to take to the seas once again. The Byzantine Empire in 674 AD. In the imperial engineering works, a race is on to design and build the two great weapons of the fire ship. The secret fire-breathing machine and the catapult. Sadly, their engineers left no blueprints, no secret recipe for the ancient napalm, Greek fire. But a new team is ready to follow in their footsteps. In England, bronze caster and specialist in ancient metalwork, Andrew Lacey, is teaming up with welder Colin Hughes to unlock the mystery of the fire machine. It lights, what's gonna happen? <laughs> you know, you gotta, you, it's for me, you got a potential bomb there. In France, two master craftsmen, Renaud Befet and Roland Fonari, have taken up the challenge to construct the catapult. There's still the problem of cracking the secret formula behind Greek fire, the incendiary fuel for both machines. That falls to Dr. Sidney Alford, explosives expert and consultant to the American and British military. I wouldn't like to be on the receiving end of that. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't just a pretty effect. It, it was a serious incendiary. They have just one month to get everything ready before they assemble here. It might not look much now, but this will soon be a nine million gallon water-filled arena for a 21st century fire ship. The evidence for how the Byzantines built these two fiery machines is extremely sketchy. 
Only a few of their chronicles and war manuals written in Latin and Greek have survived. And there is just one image of the fire ship itself, a highly stylized illumination from the 12th century history of an imperial officer. Unbelievably, it shows what looks like a modern flamethrower, a bronze siphon or tube spraying the incendiary mixture over an enemy ship. In Devon, Professor John Holden is using it as a starting point. The first challenge is to design a machine that can shoot flaming oil out under pressure. Right, here is an example of um, a hypothetical liquid fire projector. This is one that a, a colleague and I developed um, quite a long time ago. Um, and we've tried to build into this all the features that we have described in the sources. Um, so we have here a pump, probably a single cylinder pump for pushing air into a container filled with um, oil. The container is placed on a brazier or hearth. The oil would then be pressurized in here, an exit tube with a tap to release the pressure leading to the nozzle and the oil then shoots out upon pressure being right and the tap being opened. John may have read all the ancient sources, but the problem is it sounds like a pressure cooker waiting to explode. This thing of uh, heating the oil just seems like it's... Uh, Too dangerous. Well, yeah. yeah. Anyone should put a vessel containing oil or any other inflammable on a, on a, on a boat, light a brazier underneath it, and, and, for example, as I take an extreme case, ask me to board the ship. I wouldn't like it. It is a potential bomb. Yeah. There's real serious problems with the actual materials at that time. If there's any porosity, if there's any flaw in the metal at all, if this is petroleum and it's going to be at a relatively high temperature or high pressure, any light fractions, any kind of vapours that come out, they're going to ignite at some point, going to be very highly volatile. If it's underneath the hull, you're going to have a wonderful explosion under there. I mean, I'll blow the whole front of the ship apart, probably. You know. I'll read you a bit from a... It's obviously translated from a, a 9th century Latin source. It's an entirely reliable Latin source, which says the following. They made a hearth in the bow of their ship, on which they rested a vessel of bronze filled with the above ingredients, the text has already described, oil mixed with various resins, and put fire under it, that's to say under the vessel of bronze. But that makes it very clear that the oil was in a bronze container and it was on a hearth. So there's no way we can get round that one. There had to be a hearth with a bronze container. Andrew and Colin start work on a prototype for the flamethrower. They're cutting a few corners by using heavy machinery. But they've been told the joints must be made and sealed, just as the Byzantines would have done, using hemp and animal fat. So let's stroke it into it. Let me get the head on. The yeah. skeleton of the bronze siphon has already oh, begun to take shape. Heavier. In theory, okay. it looks like it'll do the job. That works well. Yeah, nice one. There's going to be a reservoir behind us, full of oil. It's going to come down behind us, comes up through this stem. We've got a central pivot that enables us to go from left to s left to right and all over the place, getting everyone in front of us. Um, comes up round these two sides, and we've got two more pivots in the middle. So it gives us up and down, so we can get everything from masthead to poor sailors in the sea, as it were all over the place. And then as the oil shoots down here, through the nozzle, we've got the flame at the end, some sort of wick burning away, and uh, that'll catch the flame to light. The only question is, will it be safe? I mean, when, we, when you stop bellowing this stuff through, what's going to happen to it then? I mean, we're going to have all this oil trickling back with flames and oxygen around it, so there's every chance that that's going to start catching a light. Um, and there's also whatever you spilled, whether it comes back onto you, you know, there's winds or uh, what was it, the sea rolling away. <laughs> the vapours that are going to come off it are just so flammable. The idea of trying to heat it first, no, to be honest, I just don't like it at all. I'm, I'm much happier with the idea of it being cold and us maybe having a long sort of, you know, just a pole with some, some flex or whatever around the top that's lit and you stick it up there and light it as it's shooting out. Mm. That I'm sort of fairly comfortable with, fairly. <laughs> You know we're all going to get killed doing this. 
No. I'm not going near. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I build it, but I'm reluctant to operate it. It's a horrendous machine. It's <laughs> but in 674 AD, it was that machine that saved this city from invasion. Today, it is Istanbul in modern Turkey. Then it was known as Constantinople. The new Rome of the Byzantine world. This was the capital of an empire that stretched from the very west of the Mediterranean, across to the Middle East, and down to Northern Africa. It was also Christian, and its physical and spiritual heart was here. For centuries, the largest church in the world, the Hagia Sophia. It's absolutely fantastic, a real feeling of power and space, a sort of spiritual feeling. If walls could tell stories, they'd have a wonderful history to relate. These walls, they've observed citizens rushing in, anxiously praying about enemy invasions and sieges and will the city be conquered. They've, they, they've come to pray for victory for the emperors as they go off on campaign. And I mean, the, the, the number of stories that, that have focused on this building is, is superb, fantastic. Towards the end of the seventh century, the very fate of this great city, the Byzantine people and their faith hung in the balance. A new enemy had arisen in the east, the armies of Islam. When the prophet Muhammad united the warring Arab tribes, the Byzantine empire was at its height. But in just 40 years, the Arabs had stormed their way through two thirds of the Byzantine territory. From the Middle East, across to Northern Africa. With an army of tens of thousands and a fleet of hundreds of ships, they were now hammering at the gates of Constantinople, ready to stamp out the Byzantines and crush Christianity. In 674 AD, the city of Constantinople was under attack. The Byzantines would have to take on their new enemy, the Arabs, at sea. And while traditional land-based catapults like this Onager could fire great distances, they would be simply too large and too clumsy to maneuver on board a ship. Their engineers would have to radically upgrade their weaponry. Under pressure to stop the Arab onslaught, the Byzantines were about to unveil the second weapon for the fire ship. In France, they're feeling that pressure too. War manuals left behind by successive emperors for their sons reveal how the Byzantines abandoned the old style of catapult in favor of giant 10-foot bowspan crossbows. Roland is convinced these could be fitted with a pivot that would allow them to swivel in every direction and accommodate the movement of the waves. We're making the pivot for the mechanism to help the, me uh, to help the machine to move everywhere and be stable on the ship. The technique is similar of what they did use at the time they was making the machine. That means all made by hands. Uh, all made in one piece, no welding, and at the same time, it's made with the same material. That means it's in pure iron. It's quite bien, c'est qu'il s'arrête que pour bouffer. Try it, try it. it, it it's I not think heavy. It looks heavy on a bank to me. No, you can. We no. can, we okay, can move it, it really. You know, it. we are on a ship, moving oh. like that, and you can follow all the movement. Yeah. It seems to work, but this machine ultimately will have to fire one-pound glass balls filled with Greek fire. Whether it can do that is an entirely different matter. 
Back in England, things are not so straightforward. Andrew is working on a scaled-down model of the flamethrower. He's casting two bronze chambers that, when fitted together, will form a single tank for the oil. He's closely following the traditions of the Byzantine craftsmen. Expert metal workers. They could cast pipes, make valves, and solder joints. They would work with bronze, brass, tin, and copper. Matching their skills is meticulous and painstaking. Colin and Andrew are ready to see whether, in principle, this prototype of their weapon works. That's not the oil tank, made from two bronze cylinders, has been clamped together. For now, an electric pump will be used to force the fuel up through the siphon. They've opted for a much safer enemy this time around, and before they graduate to using oil, a much safer fuel, water. 10, 10 feet, 15 feet, going up, going up, 17 feet, maybe. Can we, can we get 20? I think we could get 20. That's about it. One thing that does get me is, I mean, I'm standing here, I'm covered in spray of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, which, if that was petrol, I would be satellite at the moment, <laughs> which is rather foul. <laughs> Shooting into the wind is the least of their worries. Their main problem is to work out how to get enough pressure in the machine to force the oil out of the siphon. John Holden thinks the historical evidence points to it being like a pressure cooker with the oil heated over a furnace. Andrew is not so sure. This charming cylinder here, this is part of John Holden's design. Right, it's a two-part cylinder. The idea was that there would be in the hull of the ship somewhere, there would be a furnace underneath it, brazier, some sort of heating device, and it would get it is so hot that it would create enough pressure inside it itself to actually force liquid out of the siphon end. One of the main problems that we've got, we've got porosity in the metal, which is gas bubbles. If you imagine uh, an aero chocolate bar, you break it in half, it's full of air, you know, holes, literally. As soon as you've got a flame underneath, kaboom. By putting a blowtorch to the cylinder, still filled with water, the temperature quickly climbs. As the pressure inside builds up to danger point, Andrew's worst fears are confirmed. Right round here, where it's darker, we've got this ring of um, porosity, all these little holes, these gas bubbles. And at the moment, I can see quite a bit of uh, liquid vapors coming up through there. I think I'm going to switch it off before something blows. There's still some coming out. Yeah, we've got steam bubbling up through these holes. And we're still getting enough pressure behind there to get little bits of water vapour come up through that and off into the air. Now, if that was petrol that was in there, you'd have a whole... All this area would be surrounded by um, gas fumes. I mean, if you've got gas fumes in here, especially if it's in the hull of a ship, and you've got a flame underneath, then the whole thing would have exploded quite happily. It's at Yedekule Fortress and its famous Golden Gate on the outskirts of Istanbul that John Holden gets a real sense of just why the Byzantines needed to build their super weapon. It was once guarded by thousands of Byzantine soldiers. Today, it's just one man, Jamil, and his dog, Erzgut. This was once the ceremonial gateway to Constantinople and part of the over 20 miles of land and sea walls that encircle the city. This is wonderful frontage for the imperial triumphal entry. Fantastic marble work as well. You can look at the size of this golden gate, or what's called a golden gate, with these huge towers on either side, these three huge ceremonial entrances, and you can see some of the magnificence of the architecture. And of course, you have to imagine that this was burnished stone, much of it covered in bronze, copper, or gold plate, so it would have given a phenomenal, um, a glorious, triumphal aspect. It was seven miles from here that the Arab fleet arrived with hundreds of ships and tens of thousands of soldiers. And it was to here that the Byzantine messengers brought the terrible news. 
in what would be one of the great sieges of the ancient world. From 674 AD, the Arabs maintained an almost constant blockade of the city for four years. The very survival of the Christian Empire hung in the balance. Whatever pressure the Byzantines were under, back in England, our team is beginning to feel it too. With only two weeks left to get the machine up and running, they still haven't cracked the problem of how to force the oil out of the flamethrower. They've now abandoned John Holden's pressure cooker idea and instead have constructed a hand pump. They're taking their inspiration from ancient technology. This is pretty similar to what the Romans were using for their water pumps for firefighting in, um, in Rome. Those ancient pumps also used one-way valves to regulate the flow of water. Andrew is praying the same technology will be enough to stop flaming oil from flowing back down through the machine. So theoretically, liquid is going to be sucked through, come through the pipe, opens up, and then on the downstroke of the piston, it's going to be pushed shut, sealing it. These bronze flap valves have to be tightly sealed into small chambers, ready to slot into the pipework. Any leaks from these, and the whole machine could explode. Behind the city walls, the Byzantines knew they couldn't keep the Arabs out forever. They turned to the engineering works of the city arsenal, an ancient research and development center, to devise weapons that could quite literally blow the Arabs out of the water. Well, I, I always imagined it a bit like a James Bond movie, where you've got all the background noise of hammers bashing on metal and, and the sawing uh, noises of carpenters, metal workers and so on, lots of hubble and, and lots of noise and so on, and off-scene sort of crashes and bashes. It would be here that a series of crucial inventions would be made. And by one man, a Christian refugee who fled the Arab invasion from Syria. His name was Callinicus. Now, Callinicus is a real mystery man. I mean, he's a sort of Q. You know, he's some sort of whiz kid with, with, uh, with uh, chemistry or whatever. Um, he's supposed to have been uh, a, an architect or an engineer. And he was the one who supposedly brought liquid fire and the flamethrower principle to Constantinople, which saves the empire. In 7th century Constantinople, it was Callinicus who first concocted the secret recipe for Greek fire, and who probably designed the machine as well. He would have been wrestling with the same problems as our team, how to get a streaming jet of flaming oil to shoot out of the weapon, and how to avoid incinerating yourself in the process. The team have come to a special government testing facility in northern England for the latest trials of the flamethrower. It's no laughing matter this time round. Ultimately, they will test exactly the same fuel used by the Byzantines, but for now, they will experiment with the closest modern equivalent, neat paraffin. Once the piston heads have been sealed with hemp and animal fat, their new pump can be put to the test. The main worry is anything leaking around here and catching fire. And the other one is the jet end, that uh, we don't get the oil through fast enough. You know, so it doesn't actually make a proper jet and just start, you know, it makes a pool of oil around our feet, basically. That's a bit of a concern. They're awful, aren't they? Hey, thought I might. Fine Byzantine craftsmanship may have kept their flamethrower from leaking, but this machine's joints are a disaster even those using modern welding. Yeah, it's leaking like... It's cracked, isn't it? We've got um, leaks around this. There's a, a bronze plate, and it's cracked in the welding of it. If you had this type of leak on a ship, <laughs> you'd be covering the hull of the ship with, you know, petrol-based, you know, oil. Oh, I can't speak now. For now, Andrew and Colin are having to patch it up as best they can with modern sealing tape. Hello. 
have wondered what a chicken feels like when it's going in the oven. <laughs> That's right, as long as I don't have to move, isn't it? They can't put it off any longer. They'll just have to hope that the seals hold. Just in case, they've got the fire service on standby. You want to move in with your flamethrower? Sydney Alford is on hand to provide them with a light. OK, guys, go for it. The problem is that in his protective suit, Andrew can't see that the wind has changed direction. The fire jet isn't even strong enough to hit the target. Everyone else runs for cover as it blows straight back at them. This machine is going to need a shield. That was quite an untidy squirt. It was blowing all over the place. It was finely divided, almost atomized on the edge, and that's what facilitates the ignition. However, I reckon there's quite a lot of scope to um, modify the fuel, to thicken it up a bit. That, that will also tend to give a more coherent stream, so it wouldn't blow all over the place quite as badly as it did then. What you really want is for the fuel to stick on the target and burn and burn and burn. The Byzantines had to have worked out what to add to the oil to ensure it hit the target, and in the nick of time. The siege of Constantinople had held almost consistently for four years, with Arab armies ranged the length of the land walls and with their two fleets maintaining a blockade of the sea. Finally, the Byzantine fire ships sailed round for battle and, according to the 9th century historian Theophanes, incinerated the Arab ships and every man aboard. Malta a sunny island at the heart of the Mediterranean, and once part of the great Byzantine Empire. For the next three days, the fire ship will be put through its paces in this extraordinary water-filled testing tank. It is normally used as a massive cliff-top filming set, one of only two in the world, and the next feature film is on its way. The British team have now been joined by the French. Together, they have only one day to get the ship rigged and a day each to test the catapult and then the flamethrower. The hull of a classical war galley is ready to be converted into a fire ship. Permission to go aboard. Does it float? After you, you can test the ladder. Like the Byzantine emperor before him, John Holden immediately assumes command. OK, so, I mean, to make it work reasonably, we're going to have to move that whole <laughs> prow, aren't we? Because bear in mind, this is, a, thick, this is a, a, a swivel device that will move, you know, 80, 90 degrees round. Yeah. And you have to check the structure, of course, but take it off level with that, uh, where that beam is at the top. Down here. While the prow is being removed, Andrew and Colin can at last show John Holden what they've done to his design for the flamethrower. Uh, so we've got the lion's head as well. The lion's head, Great. which I love because it's all so light. Yeah, super. Andrew's keen to show off the artistic part. So we've got here. Oh, you should enough. have the, the flames, flames coming out. That would be absolutely brilliant, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that'll be just how it's described in some of the texts as well, with the, the animal's head shooting flames out, you know, like dragons and lions and stuff. But what they haven't yet told him is that they've removed the principal feature of his design, the idea of heating the oil. Is there any um, uh, space in the way the machine's set up to, to preheat the oil, which seems to be one of the features of the texts? Not at the moment, no. OK, so do we, are we going to think about that, or do you think it's going to be impossible to do because it's too dangerous? I mean, I personally think it is dangerous, the idea of having the, the oil directly heated. OK, before we did a little you know, a test, right, yeah. the, the pressure cooker idea. Right. And we put a, a flame underneath it. 
with water in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was completely sealed. And we could see, even though this is, say, fingers breadth thick, you yeah. know, it's 12 mil, that sort of yeah. thing, there was enough pressure inside there and enough porosity, which is the main thing, yeah. in the casting for gas and vapours to actually leak out the top. The place. Yeah. 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 My dangerous. problem is that the, the sources are very clear about the direct heating. They make it absolutely apparent that certainly in the earlier texts, heating the actual reservoir is, is there. It's described quite clearly. Mm. It would be quite nice if we could work, work at some way of actually building that into it. It would be relatively safe. I mean, obviously, relative is relative, but uh, obviously, if the, if the cauldron goes up, then the whole ship's doomed anyway. And presumably that happened. It's just that it's never mentioned in any source. There's nobody left to tell you. The ship has to be ready to launch in four hours. Both teams are under pressure, and there's not a moment to waste. Andrew knows there can't be any leaks this time round. He's putting more faith in ancient methods and using pitch to seal the joints. Just smoothing off these joints, I've got uh, a lot of pitch on that to stop the leaks from happening. If we're going to get leaks, we also means we can do running repairs on the boat. OK. Yeah, so we can hold it like that. Last time they fired up the flamethrower, the wind nearly incinerated the team. Colin is taking no chances. We're clad in the front of the ship, the prow of the ship, with uh, copper, so that if we get any spillage or spray back from the nozzle when we're firing, we don't uh, sort of defeat the object and start to uh, set ourselves on fire. And John is not giving up on the ancient sources. There has to be an alternative reason for heating the oil. Some texts tell of wood resins added to the oil to make it stick more to the target. 70 degrees. Maybe heating it would help dissolve these. OK. OK, right. this, is, uh, this is where we see the effect of Greek fire when it really hits something. OK, so that's pretty effective. I don't think we can get that out of that. <laughs> Why do you have to have an open hearth with this stuff? Like this, you know, that, and pour, have open flame in contact it, with it? That's what the sources say. I mean, we're just following say, the historical they, sources. Well, they actually specifically say that they heat the oil in a The oil is hearth. heated in a cauldron on a hearth, or in fact, it says on a furnace in one text. So we're trying to stick to what we know, and clearly it works. I mean, obviously, it's dangerous. You wouldn't want to do that now, obviously. But on the other hand, we're trying to be as true to the historical sources as we can. Wow. Yes. The end of day one in Malta. Up until now, it's taken a month of research and construction to get just one fire ship this far. At its height, the Byzantine fleet had hundreds of ships, some of the same size, some twice as large. Tomorrow, putting the weapons to the test can really begin. We've got to the moment of truth, really. Will, will this work under the sorts of conditions that would have, would have applied then? And will it do the things that we think the texts appear to be claiming it did? <laughs> we're, all, we're all pretending that we're not frying. <laughs> Crapping matter. Well, I want to go home from this. I don't want to die out here, particularly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got something that basically works. What we're trying to do now is see if we can tinker with it to make every bit of evidence slot in. If we can yeah. do that, I'll be the happiest historian in, in the world for at least an hour or two. <laughs> Day two in Malta. In the tank, a target boat has been anchored 60 feet in front of our fire ship. It's time, finally, to test the weaponry. And Renault and Roland are up first with their catapult. This is the first time a fire ship catapult has been built. And John is just about to fire it. He has been a Byzantine military historian for 25 years. It's a dream come true. We can put uh, fire pots yeah. or, or a, a arrow. A big you know? bolt. Yeah. yeah. Right, I see. Oh, with those of blank. <laughs> it may look like just a lot of hard work, but it actually takes a lot of skill to operate. We put this in? You put the... Uh, the boards in it on these two metal pine on the top. Yeah. Like that. Like that. And then we load. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. All right, ready to release. A thousand years in the waiting. The moment has at last arrived. Three, two, one, release. Boom. Oh. Well, I'm here. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. On pourra pas plus. Okay. Release. Whoa. <laughs> Very good. We went right across. Afterboard. So we've got the range <laughs> fine. <Yeah>. Three. <laughs> Direct hit. Now they're ready for the incendiary fire pot. A kind of ancient precursor to the Molotov cocktail. No one knows what was put in these ancient grenades, but after a review of the history books, Sydney has come up with an extraordinary incendiary cocktail with some unusual additives. Uh, mayonnaise, mayonnaise. Uh, the principle of this is that I have taken eggs as a, an emulsifying agent. I've taken the yolks of the eggs. Um, why look for something else if uh, Eggs are well known. Mayonnaise has been well known since Roman times. The yolk of the egg, of course, contains a lot of water. Um, into the water, I added uh, a, a little uh, Dijon mustard, uh, also, I'm sure, known to the ancients. Uh, there we are. I avail myself of the opportunity. Um, that is, uh, it helps in the emulsification process. Um, I then took paraffin, or, or kerosene, and I poured it in and mixed it because what I want is a rather pudding-like material, which I have succeeded, I think you will agree, in achieving. Now, if, if it can hit the target and ignite, on, be ignited on the target, it is the, ta the target that will regret it. The incendiary mayonnaise is squeezed into glass pots, ready for firing. Look at that. Last-minute nerves are beginning to show. The crew are assembled and ready to fire the incendiary bombs. Each of these has been doused in crude oil to ensure they ignite. It's extremely dangerous, and a squabble about safety has broken out on deck. When you flame, if I say, if I look the thing burning, I release. No, no because no, I can no, be no, here no. and you'll kill me. No, no. if I'm going oh, to light it, you don't discharge it until yeah. I say I'm happy with it being released, please. <laughs> I'll light it. Yeah. I'll retire when I think that it's not going to go yeah. out. And when I have a got to a position of relative safety, I'll say... <laughs> no, you. no, why no. you will be there and I will still stay there? I don't worry. No, I'm oh, not I worried. Don't. I'm okay, not worried. No. I just want the safety you know for everybody. That's okay. all. Yeah. Right. I, I, please. I, please. The Malta fire service are on hand. The catapult is prepped. They're ready. <sighs> Si je te dis, oui, oui, oui. Bon, ça, moi, c'est 5 secondes, hein, c'est fou, hein, tu dois. 5 secondes. 5 secondes, hein. D'accord. Three, between three, shoot, three hein. and, and five, if not, we shoot anyway. Move out. Okay, ready to fire. Three, two, one, shoot. Oh, merde. Dis rien. Three, two, one, go. The problem is it's not the on the machine, it's not on what we're doing, yeah. it's, it's the, the way we change the content. Yeah. Yes. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go! Oh, God damn it! <laughs> Excellent shot. Right on target, slightly too high. I would like to uh, make another shot, you know, because uh, the, sh the boat is not burning, it's not funny. <laughs> It's 6.30, and they're losing light. If they are ever going to hit the boat, they've got one shot left to do it. OK, ready to fire. Go on. Three, two, one, fire! Yes! Yeah. Beautiful! Yeah. Oh. Burning inside. Yes. Burning inside the boat, yes. yes. You can see yeah. the flames. I yes. like it. So we've set the, bo the boat on fire. Oh, look, 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 look. It, 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 it's burning. It was burning. It burned for a while. So that's yes. good. Yeah. So very, very good. I mean, a hard day's yes. work, but we actually managed to do it in the end. Yeah. Excellent result. Oof. All we need to do is destroy <laughs> the ship tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>
There is only one day left and the target boat is still very much intact. Over a thousand years ago, the Byzantines managed to destroy an entire fleet with their secret weapon. Now it's time for our team to bring on the big guns. Okay. They've learned a lot from their tests to date. They've added a shield to protect them from any splashback and a wick at the end of the siphon to ignite the flame. Whoops, I'm gonna have to Okay, this way. Okay. You go in. The weapon is in place. It now only needs the fuel. We can go further forward. Until now, the team have been using modern refined paraffin. But they know the Byzantines used crude oil. A treatise written by one 10th century emperor reveals they collected it from surface wells north of the Black Sea and in eastern Turkey, where a particular light crude oil would bubble to the surface. Those wells have long since dried up, but oil fields, known as the Mycop rock formation, still flow miles below. Oh, hey. oh there she blows. The team have managed to get a special consignment sent over. It's the first time they've had a chance to inspect it. Brilliant. Yeah. Excellent. That's excellent crude, isn't it? Very light as well. Mm. Beautiful stuff. What do you think? It's going to go well? It's well. good. I mean, it's... It's quite mobile. Yeah. It looks yes. heavy, but it's quite. Oh, yeah, smooth enough. Yeah. Isn't That's it? going to be See. really easy to pump. Fantastic stuff. Yeah. Right, here's the oil. Lovely. First load of the uh, special oil. OK. Got it. Wow, yeah. Go for it, guys. A quick squirt to ensure the oil is flowing through the machine and they'll be ready. Ah, ah, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And one whole next one. I'm almost inclined just to take the whole lot off and just have it as a short barrel. Mm. And spray over the top of that. The thing is, look out for it. It's just dripping yeah, straight down yeah. there. This is all going to catch light. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> Andrew has decided to shorten the nozzle. The experience has taught them they can't afford to have any leaks. Ready to go? Um. Right. Wow! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Okay. What's going on? How is no, it? No, no, that's much better. Much better. There's only one thing left to do. At John Holden's insistence, a furnace is being lit under the oil tank. Powdered wood resin will now be slowly stirred in, making a more glue like mixture, which should stick to the target. Yeah, I can feel it all in the bottom now. Is enough for now? Yeah. And all this above a wooden deck. They may well be cooking up a bomb. Uh, it will be very dangerous were this to be splashed, were this to splash and run down the outside, because it would, it would ignite, be ignited by the brazier and flash back to the main vessel. Of the uh, actual and potential dangers that we have seen so far, I would rate this operation we're doing now as outweighing all the others by far. Feel it grinding on the bottom now. Mm. Two fire teams are in position. One by the target boat to stop any flames blowing back at them, and one on the fire ship in case the tank explodes. With only a gentle wind, it's the best conditions they could ask for. They're ready. This is the moment I've been waiting for on and off for 25 years since I first started studying this particular weapon. So it's very interesting to see now if we can make it work properly. So we're all ready to go. OK. OK.
Okay, you're up. Go for it. No, no, I, I push it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're going to have to push it. Go, guys, go! Brilliant! Wow, that's really good! Go on, guys, go on! As the temperature soars to over a thousand degrees, it's all too easy to forget that this is the technology of a long lost empire from over a thousand years ago. Very impressive. Brilliant jet of flame. The boat's in a dangerous position, blistered, the sails have gone. Absolutely superb example of how it would work. Really impressed. Much better than I expected. Super. This is the first time that I actually felt the heat because um, before I had the silver suit on. You yeah. can't feel a thing in there, but this time yeah. it's really, you know, it's starting I mean, to hit you. I was standing way back in, uh, amidships and the heat was really searing. It's mm. really amazing. Uh, it's quite surprising, yeah. No, I was standing amazing. here and could definitely feel it. So, <laughs> should we repeat it and uh, oh, yeah, have yeah. another go? Brilliant, yeah. okay. One month of hard graft, countless leaks and a tenacious refusal to give up on the ancient sources has allowed our team to bring the fire ship back to the Mediterranean. Evidence scattered across five centuries of imperial manuscripts reveals how the fire ship was used right up until the 12th century. Again and again, it saw off the Arabs and other would-be invaders incinerating their ships and drowning their crews in the Sea of Marmara, within sight of the Constantinople walls. Well, there's no doubt now that we know the principle, and there's no doubt now that we know roughly how they did it. So it's really exciting. We've made a huge step forward, and we've done very, very well indeed. I mean, it's proof that it's worked. And even though there's all tons of leaks and whatever else that was going on, you could, you could revise this again and again, but it works beautifully. Now they can appreciate just how the brainchild weapon of the ancient engineer Callinicus, like the tank and the atom bomb, would change the course of history. So the legend goes, it was this awesome weaponry that let the Byzantines see off a mighty new power, save their empire for another 500 years, and throw a lifeline to keep Christianity afloat. Legend has now come to life. It's all about the grey matter next tonight with Wogan and his perfect recall. <laughs>